Okay, sorry about that. If you were online, um, we don't know what happened. I don't know if we had a power surge or something, but all of a sudden my screen went black. And um, Terry goes, I don't think it's working. So um, sorry about that. We are, we are live now. So uh, if you are back with us, we appreciate your patience. Uh, sorry that that happened. We'll pick up right where we, <clears throat> right where we uh, got booted off. Um, the question was, right before we got booted off, is were there other healers and things for Jesus? And, and my answer was, there were people who were offering cures and things, you know, medicinal plants, things of that nature. That's not new. It's, it's what doctors do today. But we're talking about a healing, both physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological. I mean, yeah. Jesus' healing is a complete... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was the first and only. Yeah, I mean, the only one that can do that, yes. Now... Now, now, be careful with that because he's going to give us the ability to do that. When we get to talk about acts, you'll have yeah. see those things, which, by the way, is something that we have long let go as a tradition that I wish we hadn't. We have great, we have great spiritual power through the power of the Holy Spirit that we don't tap into. Um, if you ever take a class on acts, um, I spend a lot of time talking about that because it's it's. <clears throat> it's one of the richest traditions that we have let go, which I don't really understand why we've let it go, but we, we have in some respects. So. Um, all right. Let's talk about a miracle story. And I want you to flip over to chapter 5 <clears throat> and look at verse 21. So chapter 5, verse 21. I'm not going to read this in its entirety, but I'm going to go through it. It starts with Jesus is crossing over the lake, and there's, of course, a crowd. And there's a man who's a ruler in the synagogue named Jairus there. And Jairus says that his daughter is dying. And he asked Jesus to come and lay hands on her. So Jesus heads toward their house. Along the way, if you remember the story, there's a woman in the crowd who has been suffering from hemorrhaging for many, many years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she gets up to near Jesus, and I want you to hear what it says. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, there's that word, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone from him. He turned around the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? The disciples answered, You see people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, Who touched my clothes? Oh, those disciples... Jesus, Jesus knew something had happened, and he knew who it had happened to. They're still trying to figure it out. So, but what this is, is a miracle story inside of a miracle story. So you got the story, he's headed toward Jairus' house. What if he didn't head toward Jairus' house? Well, the woman might not have met him. You see, one of the things that Mark shows you is that Jesus' power is so incredible that on that literally there's nothing that can get in that way. Somehow or other, he ended up on the road that this woman needed him to be on. She touches his cloak, she's healed, and he goes on about his way. And he goes to Jairus' house, but what's happened when we get there? The girl, the daughter's dead. So in this story, you have a girl who's dying, a woman who's been suffering so much that no other healer has been able to fix this. And then, taking the time to do this one, the little girl dies. Explain that one. That's a tough one, isn't it? Because what, if I didn't tell you the rest of the story, what might your response be? 
if you were Jarius, what would your response be? Hmm? He, didn't care. he didn't care. Why did he not care? What did he do? He stopped to heal somebody else. I've never been selfish about things of God. <laughs> this speaks directly to this. But Jesus does care. And he cares about the woman who's been suffering for 14 years or whatever it is. And he cares about the little girl. One doesn't supersede the other. One's not more important than the other. They both absolutely matter to Jesus. So much so that he goes to the little girl's house. And he actually gets mad at them for wailing. And he's like, she's, she's okay. She'll live. And he goes in and he says, Talitha kum. Little girl, I say to you, get up. There's that word get up again. We saw that earlier, right? Take the Shabbat and walk. And she gets up. She was 12 years old. By the way, the lady was bleeding for 12 years. <clears throat> so about the same length of time. They both, you know. But they both mattered. They both mattered to him. In the midst of turmoil for Jarius, Jesus still did the right thing. He didn't get so focused on one thing, he couldn't do both things. He healed the woman and he healed the girl. You see what Mark is getting here. But there's more. You ever thought sometimes that there are bigger problems than yours for Jesus to deal with? <laughs> You ever prayed the prayer, Lord, I know this isn't a big thing in the grand scheme of things, but it's bothering me. But, and, and there's this sense of trying to be trying to find some humility. Lord, I know there are bigger problems in the world, but, but here's mine. Guess what? It matters. It matters to God. It, I think Mark says it matters. So you're telling me that in the midst of the fact that literally the Roman Empire is destroying Jerusalem... That, that my family matters? Yes. My situation matters? Yes. You mean to tell me in the midst of a global pandemic, the issues in my heart matter? Yes. My, my kid and grandkid matters? In the midst of all they're going on? Yes. See how that works? It's powerful. Oh, and by the way, there's more. This is the first century. Did you catch who Jesus healed? Don't make this too hard. What do the little girl and the woman have in common? Thank you. They're both women. Now, this is the first century. Women are just a little above property. They don't vote. They don't have political power. They don't have voice. They really in that society are almost irrelevant. I don't think that's right. But Jesus was willing to go to this person's house to save the little girl. He stopped on the side of the road to heal this woman because for Jesus, yes, they matter. Women matter. This little girl matters. Everything matters to Jesus. Jesus' love and power are big enough to encompass all of that. Can you imagine how that must sound to a group of people reading this who are so brand new in the faith and at the same time are watching as the Romans are ransacking Jerusalem, the Romans are taking us off into captivity. Does Jesus really care? Does he really know what's happening? The answer is always yes. It matters. You matter. Mark's pretty powerful when he gets down to the point. Yes, sir. Think about, I've never thought about this until tonight. Think about what the, what the Pharisees must have thought. They were mad about him here. 
what about when he brought somebody back? So the question is, if the Pharisees were mad about um, him doing healings, what about this where he brings the little girl back to life? And there's going to be other stories about that. Um, I doubt it sat well. Is that a cop-out answer? Because again, again, these are people who traditionally don't matter. And by the way, telling stories about farmers... I'm not going to pick on you if there's a farmer in this room, but I mean, you're a farmer. Yeah, I mean, a fisherman. They, they weren't the highest of profession. This isn't a lawyer or the doctors or the religious authority. He's telling stories about people that other people forgot. About other people that don't have power and privilege. Mark is telling stories about people who, quite frankly, the religious authority think don't matter. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, they matter to Him. They matter to Him. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to heal the sick. The tax collectors, the sinners. The farmers, the fishermen, the women, the young people. To me, there is not much more powerful than realizing that Jesus' ministry from the very beginning was extended to all the people that mattered. Which, by the way, maybe we ought to think about when we wonder who matters. Because my guess is, and I think I present on pretty good ground here, if God created them, they matter to God. And since God created all humanity, well, I'll let you do that math. Um, again, there are some stories in chapter 6, um, good stuff, 7, there's, there's all kinds of good stories. A lot of them follow the same pattern. We're not going to look at those in great detail. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to look at one last story for the evening. And then I'll ask for, come for questions. Um, but I want us to look at the feeding of the 5,000 story. And that's Mark chapter 6, verse 30. <clears throat> Excuse me. Starting in verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from the towns and got there ahead of them. Well, let me tell you, they want to be near this guy. When Jesus landed and saw the great crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. By the way, not an unfair request. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. That's not the response they were looking for. I think they were looking for, hey, you know what, that's a good idea. Let's send them down the road. No, no, no. You give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wage. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Now, 
If I was to go down to the children's room right now, by the way, there are 43 of them down there today. Is that not amazing? Awesome. That's huge. What if I went down there with two cookies? What are the kids going to say? How are they going to react to those two cookies? Well, they're not going to be happy. Why are they not going to be happy? Because only two kids get it. Oh, so you're, you're only two kids are going to get part of that cookie? Yes. So you're saying that two cookies is not going to feed 43 kids? No. And so you're, you're going to agree here that five loaves of bread and two fish is not going to feed 5,000 people. Congratulations, you're a good disciple. <laughs> um, no, no, but this is the whole time. Yeah. We don't realize the miracle is about to happen. That's right. Well, that's exactly right. Because uh, here again, I think Mark wants you to walk that road, just like with the agrarian images and just like the boat images. We've all been there at an event or a family gathering where food sort of became scarce near the end. You know, um, I, 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 yeah, we've all been there. I'll just say that. Add more water to the soup. Add more water to the soup. John, John, you showed us a thing. And, and yet, what Mark shows you is how little it actually takes for Jesus to do something ridiculous. Okay, here's what I want you to do, boys. Break them up into fifties and hundreds. Okay. <laughs> Whatever, Jesus. And I'm going to bless these couple of breads, a couple of fish, and then I want you to go and pass them out. I mean, I can just see them thinking, this is going to take about that long. And they start passing it out. And I don't know if you remember, there was a story Jesus told this story quite a bit, actually, about a farmer who sows seed, and, and if it ends up in the good seed, it multiplies 30, 60, 100 times. You remember that story? I don't know. It's been a long time since we studied that story, like 36 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Look what happens with just a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. There's a story. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a while, 34 minutes ago since we studied it, um, about sometimes you put the seed in the ground and you go to bed, you don't really know how it grew, it just did. I'm not sure how five loaves of bread and two fish fed 5,000 people, but it did. You know this pattern here? This really is the same story. The feeding of the 5,000 is almost an identical story to those other parables. Literally, it's the same story. Just happening right in front of their face. By the way, they're going to learn this so well that they're going to feed 4,000 a little later and have the same problem. <laughs> okay? They're going to make the same mistake again. But once again, Mark says, look, what you think is little, what you think doesn't matter. Oh, by the way, have you noticed how things that we don't think matter really matter? Hmm. So, so maybe right now in a time of great persecution where my life doesn't seem to matter to the Roman government, maybe my life matters to God. Maybe in the midst of our time, a global pandemic and racial turmoil, incredible divide in our country. 
Maybe I think I'm insignificant, but maybe, maybe I matter to God. Have you noticed in Mark how what seemingly is insignificant is actually the most important thing in the room? I find that completely fascinating. Because, let me assure you, if I did a poll, I mean, I'll just share with you today. Pam's in there counting how many people we have registered, how much food do we need, da, 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 da. She does this every week. It's amazing, by the way. She does great. But if I went and told Pam, guess what, Pam? There's 5,000 coming, and I'm giving you five breads and two fish. <laughs> you know what Pam's next words would be? I quit. <laughs> After she gave us a big. After she went. But you know what? Pam probably wouldn't do that. Because she's one of those faithful people I know. She'd probably go, we'll figure out how to make it work. I don't know how it works. But sometimes I go to bed and something sprouts. Sometimes things fall on the right soil and it grows 60, 30, 60, 100 times. What I know about this is that Jesus met the need that was literally in front of him. One of the things about Mark that is so incredibly interesting. Have you noticed that Jesus always deals with what's right in front of him? How often do we as people get so caught up on what's happening over there or that way or in that country or in this state or blah, 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 that sometimes we fail to see what is literally right in front of us? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 5,000 men. Now that doesn't include women and children. Yeah. All of a sudden, I would imagine that other baskets of fish and. That's I'm very thinking, likely. And I'm thinking, okay. Where'd all this come from? Where did all this come from? But I want to close with this. As impressive as taking five loaves of bread and two fish is and feeding 5,000, that's not the most impressive part. You're like, how do you beat that one? You know how you beat that one? There were 12 basketfuls yes. of broken pieces. Yes. There was so much abundance. You, what you see as scarcity, what you see that doesn't matter, God turned into an abundance. They didn't just eat. They didn't just get like a crumb. It says, it very clearly says they ate and were satisfied. Now look, I'm a big boy. It takes quite a bit to satisfy me. I've been to the Chinese buffet. They see me coming, they get scared. We're talking that kind of level, though. Every person ate and was satisfied, and there were 12, broken, 12 baskets of broken pieces left over. You want to talk about miraculous. You want to talk about power. You want to talk about authority. You want to talk about why this man that Mark makes this incredible claim about as Son of God, Christ, because little things matter to him. His power is bigger than you and I can understand. It calms wind and waves. It multiplies bread and fish. It even grows things without you and I even knowing how it works. That's power. By the way, those are all things only one other person in the entire scripture can do. And that is God himself. <laughs> Good stuff tonight. There's other things. Again, I'll, I'll be happy to go over some more. Um, I don't want to miss I'm just trying to give you some highlights because there's so much. Thoughts, questions, comments? Yes, Bob Berry. All right. Uh, as far as the uh, loaves and the fishing are concerned. Yes. First 52 in my Bible, it says, this is the, the disciples. They're in the ship. They're going to oh. Cross. And it says he came walking by. 
<laughs> Again. And in verse 52, it says, For they considered not the miracle of the Lord. <laughs> Their the hearts were hard. Heart was hard. Yeah, he's talking about words, chapter 6, verse. Everybody but them. Yeah, he's talking about verse uh, 52 of chapter 6, where Jesus walks on water. And it says very clearly, they just didn't understand about the loaves and the fishes. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Well, but they saw the miracle. They, saw, yeah, they, they were there. Out. They passed them out. There was a basket each of leftovers for each of them. Okay. There's 12 of them, right? By the way. By the way. The thing about it is, whenever we doubt, yeah. and we question, we certainly have these men. Oh. Look, this is not rocket science. Like, this is not stuff that we don't understand. We live this. But you can't use it for this. No, you can't. By the way, you notice 12 keeps showing up. 12 years the lady was bleeding. 12 years old the girl. 12 basketfuls of golden figs. There's 12 to sign. We'll get there. We got it. Um, they had 12 tribes in Israel. A lot of 12s. But I, exactly. One of the things that Mark doesn't allow is for you to leave the gospel of Mark and go, I just don't get it. It's the same story over and over and over and over again. Great work. I appreciate y'all. Thank you very much. I'm going to close this in prayer. Thank you for watching online. Uh, sorry we had a little technical difficulty. Don't know what that was, but we'll put it all together in one video to put on YouTube. But thank you for being with us. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, I thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you, God, for this incredible gospel that teaches us so much. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all take care. Bye now. What do we read from where, where to where? Oh, I didn't tell you. Well, I'll, tell, I'll put it online. We'll put it in the comments. Um, we're going to go ahead and read 827 to chapter 10. So if, whatever you are, get up to 10.